My name is Aaron Stanton. I am the founding director of the VR Institute of Health and Exercise, also known commonly as the VR Health Institute. So this is who I am on paper. I've been working in the VR industry and, well, and technology industry for quite some time, and the combination of health and exercise and technology, uh, weight loss and fitness, is something that I've been working on for several years. So a few years ago, in 2016, uh, I got together a group of friends. Uh, we got together to talk about the future of, of VR. Now this friend group was more than just a group of, of friends spending time together. It included the founders and CEO of companies that went on to be acquired by Apple twice, Intuit, News Corp, Thomas Reuters, uh, and others. Taken together, this brain trust was responsible for founding and selling $1 billion for the technology companies in the last 10 years. At the time, I had three primary interests in XR, virtual and augmented reality, right? Remote communications, vocational education, health and exercise. And then of those three, health and exercise is the one that impacted my life the most because I was getting up and I was exercising in virtual reality three days a week. And what I, what I asked the group, I said, please let's think about this. Like I said, how do, we, how do we make VR exercise a viable industry five to 10 years faster than it would otherwise be on its own? So we identified the problems that we thought were going to be facing everybody, the industry as a whole, when it came to VR, augmented reality, and exercise. And then we came up with a plan to try to fill the holes that we didn't think anybody else was going to do. Step one, problem one, is what we've referred to, or at least what I refer to, as the cute kid problem. The second step, we call I refer to as the fractured kingdom problem. And the third step, which I'm not gonna talk about much today, is what I refer to as the matrix problem. So let me start with the cute kid problem. Right? I don't mean this in a good way, like, uh, oh, that guy's really cute kind of way. Uh, I mean this in the, the dismissive little kid brother, oh, you're so cute sort of way, right? The I don't really take you seriously sort of way. Several years ago when I was in London, I saw this poster on the wall uh, from the British Heart Association, and it demonstrates perfectly how we've taught people to think about games and exercise since the 1980s. For nearly 20 years, the health industry has seen video games as the enemy, right? Games are bad. Games will literally kill you. Risk early death, just do nothing, just play video games. In 2016, if there were a rare article published about VR and health, you'd get a mix of responses, some positive, but you'd almost guaranteed to get some criticism, kind of like this one. Dude, just go to the gym, get some air, meet some girls, feel good about yourself for a change. Or like this one. The poster is looking for permission to avoid exercise. Those here supporting his delusion are harming him, not helping him. I know what it's like to get sweaty waving your arms about while using VR, and I know what it's like to exercise properly. Trust me, VR is not suitable exercise. Well, VR is not suitable for exercise. Or like this one which I refer to as the yes but comments. I like, I like this one better. Than the, I probably like the poster who wrote this one better than the posters who wrote the other ones. But I find them more dangerous. They're a little bit more reassuring to people. Like, kind of like, nah, don't worry, man. It's written as a response to the previous comments. Like, no, don't worry, it's not. Nobody's really suggesting you can get exercise while playing VR. It's the difference going from a sedentary lifestyle to being semi-active. No healthy person is going to lose 20 pounds playing Echo Arena. Good for him, though. And I like it, but, um, but it's more dangerous because it is equally wrong. It's just less obviously wrong. We've found through plenty of data that exercise can be absolutely as good in VR as you can get in regular traditional exercise. Of course, doing 100 squats while wearing a VR unit is the same as doing 100 squats when not wearing a VR unit. You absolutely can burn calories playing VR and lose weight playing VR. You can be healthy playing games. But there's a tremendous amount of hesitation in the general population and amongst the gaming population itself to see VR exercises anything other than a bunch of cute kids running around trying to convince themselves that their games are actually a healthy way to avoid doing real work, like going to the gym. This perspective has held back the entire vertical of VR and exercise. And it's embedded in the very concepts of even some of the most visionary and profound thinkers of the VR industry. At Oculus Connect 6, I had a conversation with John Carmack 
short one, about 15 minutes, about VR and health. And the next day during his keynote, to my, I was thrilled because it really shows he was thinking about it, but like during his keynote, he mentioned the conversation. I talked to somebody here yesterday that was uh, very involved in basically fitness VR stuff. And first I was like, well, don't you have a lot of fogging problems? And they said, not really, surprisingly little. And that VR can be really great for this sort of exercise. But I am dubious about it changing a lot of people's habits where I was disappointed in past years that I couldn't even get people to stand up or spin around in a swivel chair to play games with Gear VR. You know, people generally wanted to just sit down, inert one direction and move their thumbs instead of moving their body. You know, and I chuckle whenever we have our promotional stuff where you have people, you know, athletic people swinging around wildly and ducking and bending uh, with VR where that's not going to be the reality of the way people are using this product most of the time. And I, you know, making company strategic decisions uh, around your development around that might not be the wisest thing. And then I do worry that in many ways it does come down to people tend towards a little bit of laziness and inaction. I mean, this is what gave us the couch potato and all of this. And while VR can be touted as the antidote to the couch potato, it gets up, makes you active, it's going to be a niche thing. And that's something to, to keep in mind. You know, it's going to be great to have these athletic superstar events uh, where it looks amazing. But if we want to sell millions and millions to people, it's going to be a lot of people that may still just want to sit down and move their thumbs in some way. Far from convincing him that VR and exercise was something he should be paying attention to, he has serious reservations. And they're reasonable, right? We've, these, are, these are biases that have been built in for a very, very long time. The more hardcore of a gamer you are, probably the more familiar you are with those biases. It's reasonable. But I ultimately think it is wrong. So back in 2016, we decided that this cute kid problem was going to hold back everything we wanted to do. Every investment in health and VR that we might make, every company we might start, every founder we might mentor, it was going to face this issue. So for step one, we created the VR Health Institute to provide definitive scientific data about the potential of VR and AR to be good exercise. The purpose of the Institute is to provide reliable data on the actual calorie consumption of games based on metabolic testing in lab control conditions at San Francisco State University's kinesiology department. Data collection happens using public, peer-reviewed methodologies, assesses exercise potential based on measured rate of oxygen consumption, not just things like heart rate. It's about as accurate as we can do in the modern science for measuring calorie consumption of a new or a novel exercise. We've been able to demonstrate conclusively that VR and AR can offer a, as good an exercise as nearly any form of exercise equipment you might find in a gym. But that's not by itself enough. We need to figure out a way to package this information in a way that was easy for the general consumer to understand. In 2017, we introduced the VR Health rating system to help consumers find and trust the exercise content of games, drawing a clear connection between games you can play in VR and real world commonly accepted exercises known by everybody, like riding a bike, running on a treadmill. It was our belief that in order to combat the cute kid problem. We had to start drawing the parallels that these games could be used as alternatives to getting on a treadmill and just watching Game of Thrones. The games had to have traditional exercise equivalents. We did this so that, at that time was the future, when major news organizations like CNN, the New York Times, any major news organization came to us to ask, is this actually exercise? There were medical experts with bulletproof data to back up their statements of, yes, this is, in fact, exercise. You can do this and feel good about yourself while playing games. And I'm very proud to say that um, this has been extremely successful. The team at the VR Health Institute, made up mostly of, of professors from Kansas State University, graduate students, members of the VR Health Institute itself, that their work has been doing exactly what we hoped it would do. The VR Health Institute has become one of the most trusted health brands in VR today, and is doing the job that it was created for. The medical and academic professionals connected to the Institute, specifically Dr. Mary Alice Kern and Dr. Jimmy Begley, have appeared on news, international news segments online, on TV, print, and radio. Our data has been cited numerous times by CNN, the New York Times, Forbes, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Discovery Channel. 
at least three of those organizations sent a film crew to actually film and understand more about exactly how we measured and validated exercise in VR. Dozens of international mainstream and industry news outlets from across the world, including the US, Asia, Europe, South America, Middle East, all over, have cited our data in publishing articles on the subject of VR as the next coming future of exercise. And all of them, at some point in their own way, have asked, is this really exercise, or are you just cute kids playing around? And I am more than happy to say that we've been able to be there with reliable, objective, peer-reviewed data to answer those questions. We are not just cute kids messing around. We are building something important. Every one of us in this room, every one of us in this industry, we're doing something important, worthwhile. In 2019, our methodology and claims were reviewed internally by the American Heart Association, one of the most respected brands in the health industry, and we were given the highest possible marks in terms of data and testing methodology. Thousands of people are now using our VR exercise app to track their exercise, burning billions of calories in VR. In fact, the last time we could accurately measure its playtime, we calculated the Beat Saber itself by itself. It's was probably responsible for somewhere between four 0.5 and 5 billion calories consumed. And in preparing for this presentation, I'm happy to notice that we just passed the 1 millionth unique visitor to the VR Health Ratings database, which means that at least 1 million people have been exposed to highly reliable, accurate scientific data about the value of VR and exercise. And it is good exercise. In one of the very first published studies that we put out, uh, we looked at the oxygen consumption of some well-known VR games against traditional exercises, right? Competitive mountain biking, running upstairs, thrill the fight. What we found is that some of the most extreme virtual reality experiences were actually the energy equivalent of biking in the Tour de France. So very good exercise, basically. And we were also able to show what it is not, right? We were able to show how it compared to any form of exercise gaming that's come before. So you'll notice in this graph also, we have Wii Fit labeled down here. And you notice that it's not anywhere near what, say, Thrill the Fight is. So there has never been a piece of exercise equipment, in gaming or otherwise, that has, been, has the diversity and the potential for intense exercise that VR and augmented reality does. I mean, essentially, I believe that we are not far away from the day that we think of gamers the same way we think of our athletes. I mean, like, um, from a physical like health expectation wise. I can't say that we're ever likely to be as popular as the, you know, the football players. But in terms of how we think of somebody as either weak and sedentary or fit and healthy, I think that expectation will change dramatically in the next few years. To me, virtual reality, augmented reality addresses just too many of the things that make traditional exercise kind of suck for people like me who are awful at exercise to not have a substantial impact on the industry at large. The thing is, though, that these, um, these breaks, right, these, uh, these roadblocks, are actually good things. They give us time. There is still a long way to go in terms of what virtual and augmented reality can do for the health of the world today and what we are actually doing. What we as an industry are prepared to deliver on for the general non-specialist consumer. So typically, health and fitness is one of the first places non-technical consumers begin to adopt new technology. That's because they're utility-based consumers, right? They purchase the tech because it helps them accomplish a purpose instead of being enthusiastic about the new technology for the sake of the technology itself. And the adoption curve of utility-based technologies is very different than that from the technology of enthusiasts. This is part of the reason that VR adoption in fitness has been very subtle so far and why the expectation of an explosive disruptive adoption curve early on, initially in the VR life cycle, was a mistake from the very beginning, and something that I still believe is, is coming in this vertical. Fitbit, Apple Watch, Peloton, fitness tra trackers, diet and exercise trackers, these are categories that have exploded because they are mainstream consumers that have very strong need for them. They believe that these are technologies that will help save their lives. And yet, we haven't really seen them in the VR space, these consumer, we haven't really seen them. Summits like this one show that we are definitely gaining traction in VR and exercise, but there's still a relatively small handful of viable companies working specifically to explore the potential of this vertical. And I think ultimately we're thinking too small, too much like individual companies fighting for territory and not enough like pioneers in an open blue ocean looking for new customers together.
in the last four years, we've made huge strides, all of us together, on step one, on the cute kid problem. So let's start talking about step two. So these are the efforts we're making, right? Step one was the cute kid problem. And one of the efforts that we've tried to put together to address that proactively is the VR Health Institute. So now let's talk about step two, which I call the fracture kingdom problem. You see, I don't believe that VR and AR are an exercise revolution because they are fun exercise. Lots of things are fun exercise. Sports, for example. Not exactly for me, I'm not much of a sports guy, but, but for others. <laughs> I mean, whenever you have a product, exercise, that is essential for people to stay alive, and yet 70% of your consumers don't get enough of it even though it's free, your product is a problem, right? This is a very big problem here. And one of the problems that exercise in general faces is this concept of decay. All exercise equipment has a decay rate. This is not a statement that most people find hard to believe. Treadmills, rowing machines, ellipticals, uh, you use it a lot the first week, the one you buy it, you use it less the second week, less the third week, less the fourth week, and then eventually, about six months go by and you're using it to hang your dirty clothes on. This is my decay rate for the three pieces of home exercise equipment that I have ever bought for myself. And I graph them into the frequency of use from the point I purchased each one, right? So treadmill, rowing machine, elliptical. What you see is that the week I bought them, I was trying to exercise four times a week, and I did. Kind of that second week, kind of the third week. But somewhere in there, I start falling off. Suddenly, it's two times a week or three times a week, then it's one time a week, and then eventually, all of them, you know, the elliptical lasts the longest. It gets to about 15 weeks, but by then, it's like once a week. So this is, this is the future of my exercise. I, I am absolutely convinced that if I buy another exercise device, a general exercise device, this is what's going to happen to it. What people don't realize, though, is that almost everything has a decay rate. It's not just traditional exercise size equipment, right? My PS4 has a decay rate. When I bought my PS4, I bought with it launch titles. One of the very first time games that I got on my PS4 that I really, really enjoyed playing was Destiny. I played it for maybe 50 or 60 hours, I beat it, and I have not played Destiny in a long time. I have played Destiny 2. I've played other games, but Destiny 1, its decay rate ended a long time ago. This is my exercise in VR, graphed exactly the same way. Just like my PS4 has a decay rate, VR exercise has a decay rate as well. It's certainly a lot better than, than you know, my treadmill or my elliptical, but you can tell it's still a downward turn, right? Still generally going in the wrong direction. And so I was looking at this and I was thinking to myself, what are those spikes? What are the things that get me back into the game every single time I kind of fall out of it? And so, out of curiosity, uh, I went back and I, I looked at my Steam sales records, my sales receipts, and I overlaid that data on top of my chart. And, and you see a pattern, right? Every single major spike in my exercise routines came following the purchase of a new game, right? Whether it's Auto Shield or Thrill to Fight or Knockout League or Box VR, whatever it might be all the way back down to Beat Saber, which has had the strongest lasting impact on my exercise since Audio Shield, which is a little deceptively laid out here. Audio Shield actually has been a constant for a long time. What made my VR system a better piece of exercise than my elliptical, or my elliptical plus some TV show, was that it was infinitely refreshable. The long-term success of the VR fitness industry will be dependent on the diversity of games that are good exercise. You see, I have a problem as a consumer in, who exercises in VR, right? I have been playing the same six or seven games for over the last three years. Like occasionally I get a new game comes out that's pretty good exercise, but I'm still talking about one every five, six, seven months. Otherwise I'm playing, you know, pistol whipped every single day. I'm playing Beat Saber every single day. But it's worse than that, right? It's not, that's, not, that's not even the big deal, right? It's worse than that because games are games, right? The first enemy is easy. The tutorials teach you things, but they're not good exercise. And after a while, like basically the first few levels are just super easy and you get through them. 
the first guy in Thrill to Fight, it's a lot less energy than the last guy in Thrill to Fight. So I'm not just playing every single game over and over again. I'm playing the last two levels, the last guy, over and over and over and over again. The last three levels of Pistol Whipped so many times. And I can change the settings, I can push the settings to the point where it's the most exercise. I turn off aim assist so there's way more bullets flying at me because I can't hit the broadside of a barn. And I'm still getting through those levels and I'm still playing them over and over again and I need new stuff. And so I'm starting to decay again, right? I'm, I'm falling down. And every consumer who will come to us at this point in the industry will fall down eventually because we don't have enough coordinated content to keep them engaged in virtual reality and exercise. I believe this. Our success as a health industry will depend on the diversity of our content. It will depend on a unification of the limited but growing core of players that see VR as a life-saving tool. Our goal as developers in the VR fitness space should be to help each other succeed as much as possible. We are a fractured, unorganized kingdom, all on the same side, at a time when we need to be fighting this fight together in coordination. VR exercise has a problem. Our primary consumer does not yet have hardware, and only a small portion of the current hardware set owners value exercise yet. In order for game developers to succeed, we need to create a viable business path that allows small investments of time into exercise to make sense. This is the Fractured Kingdom problem, that there are people who are passionate about VR and exercise, and yet we are not organized and we are fractured, and therefore we don't know how to make those limited resources create a viable business opportunity for more developers. Luckily, while small, those of us that are already in the category of VR owners and interested in exercises, we are so much more passionate and dedicated than the average gamer. My father had a heart attack several years ago, and as part of his recovery, he has to exercise. He has to, and he hates it. He hates exercise because, like me, he's bad at exercise. All the traditional exercise doesn't work for him. But he and I, and others in the VR space, we need this in order to live, some of us more directly than others. The baby boomer population in the United States is getting older and they need to exercise. We all need to exercise more or it's gonna cost us lives. For some, Thrill the Fight is a $9.99 game. But many times I have talked to people who tell me that they went and played VR for the first time at a friend's, they played Thrill the Fight, and they realized how much exercise it was, and they went out the next day and they bought a $1,000 gaming computer and a $400 VR rig and a $9.99 game. Which means that the entire acquisition was for that last thing. That last game was what all that was for. So for some people, Thrill the Fight is a $1,410 game. That's the difference between the exercise and the gaming community. And we don't have enough $1,400 games. We don't have enough $10 games. We have the best possible customer. We have a product which saves people's lives and then if our customer doesn't buy, they die. But without coordination, our individual efforts to keep development of content alive long enough to find traction will be slow and disjointed. What we need to be doing is trying to organize the consumer that wants VR exercise to succeed with the developers who are looking for ways to stay afloat while the rest of the world catches up, and the organizations that care about the future of the health of the world. We need to be working together. That's step two. That's trying to solve the Fractured Kingdom problem. So within the next few months, we'll be introducing our next project, which is what we're referring to internally as the VR Health Empire, or as I like to refer to it, the Healthy Empire. The Healthy Empire is a consumer advocacy group to help coordinate consumers, developers, and organizations that want VR health to succeed. Our hope is that those of us that join the Healthy Empire, become citizens or whatever you want to call it, that we are made up of current VR owners who are interested in the success of VR and exercise, 
non-VR owners who are interested in a form of exercise that's totally different what they're capable of doing now, but will be able to eventually. Game developers who are looking for ways to stay sustainable while the VR market continues to evolve. And organizations that care about the future of exercise and the health of the world. One of my favorite quotes of all time, cliche as it may sound, uh, is this one, right? I saw it for the very first time years ago in a, on a wall of a cafe, like one of those plaques, you know, would have inspirational quotes. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. We are an organization that by the very nature of how we got started, those 10 people talking, we are an organization that wants us to go far, all of us to go far. Step one was an information problem. Step two is a business problem. We have to figure out how to create viable business models that allow for the creation of VR exercise content to be a good financial decision for VR developers. So these are the efforts we make. Step one, the cute kid problem. We created the VR Health Institute to try to solve these problems. Step two, the fractured kingdom problem. We create the healthy empire. That's what we're starting to do now. Just the beginnings of it, but we're working down this plan. And just like in everything we do, we look for the people who are nerdy like us, who are passionate like us, uh, willing to be a bit scrappy like us, people who are willing to fight fights in the early stages before it's time to polish them and make them super sexy for the general consumer. People willing to actually work for the success of those around them. I make a joke a lot of times when I'm, when I'm talking to different companies, and it, but it's, it's true. Like, I say sometimes, I want everybody around me to be super successful because someday I might need a job. And uh, I think it's true for everybody in this room. Not because I think that we're going to have troubles getting jobs, but because we should have this attitude that we are an industry that will grow together. We are an industry that is going to grow up together, and the people who are starting now, who are forming the networks and connections of friendship and also just collaboration with people, even competitors. Nobody is a better competitor for you than somebody who thinks a lot like you. And nobody's a better friend. So, yeah, we're looking for people willing to actually work for the success of those around them. Or another way I like to say that is we're looking for people who could agree to the statement that we will achieve our dreams by helping other people achieve theirs. Like, you give me a bunch of people to believe in exercise and believe in helping people, we believe in a statement like this, and I will give you an organization and a people who are going to do really well together over time. Like, I honestly believe you put those people together and they'll do something cool. So, uh, we'll see what happens. Um, the email address is there for a reason. So, thank you very much.